tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 10, Episode 24, the final episode of this season. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of author David Niall Wilson, about baleful bets, risky requests, unwanted undertakings, and terrifying therapies. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now... It's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. This show's about to begin. <laughs> This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by our sponsor, Apartments.com. Folks, let me take a moment to tell you about two of the best buddies someone could ever have. Mr. T, that's short for trouble, and his sister, Miss T.S., which is short for troublesome. Born in mid-June 2015, they'll turn seven in a couple of weeks here. Their personalities are completely opposite. Mr. T's the alpha male, Miss T.S. is the most chill cat you'll ever meet. They've been through a lot with me and hear most of your scary tales as I perform them. I'd never leave them behind. The point is, pets can wiggle their way into the center of your life. They command your heart and your snacks. And at some point, you find yourself making decisions that are revolve around them. I know I can trust Apartments.com with this search because Apartments.com has helped millions of renters find their perfect place to live and has the most pet-friendly listings on the internet. So you can find a rental with roll-worthy carpet for getting tummy rubs, a place near a park for walks, or that perfectly sunlit windowsill for cozy afternoon naps. There might even be a room or two in there for you, pet person. Visit Apartments.com. The place to find a pet-friendly place. Thank you for listening and for supporting the sponsors that make this show possible. There are plenty of reasons not to place a bed. Especially now that you can click a button on your phone and lose 500 bucks easily. Thank you very much, Super Bowl spread. But some bets are a little more personal. 
and win or lose, there's more at stake than a little money. In our first story from David Nile Wilson, we'll view such a bet and see how the better deals with the results. Without further ado, I present to you Nothing But Time. No one who had ever met Bones McCullough wondered why they called him Bones. He wore a black top hat with the brim cut to a point in front, like a ducktail of stiff leather that brushed close over his brow. Running up the sides of that hat and behind were strings that tied on top. Along those strings, colored shapes with numbers, letters, and symbols clicked and clattered. If you were ever close enough, and he happened to lean down, you could catch a quick white flash of bone and a loosely tied leather bang hung around his neck. A bird skull, or maybe a rat, lay inside, covered in chains and rhinestones and small bits and pieces of life picked up from the streets and tucked away. Still, the reason was clearer than all of this taken together. Bones was tall and lanky, he wore dark trousers that flared in a boot cut over black leather hobnails, a jacket that had once been part of something very fine, and now fell somewhere between a circus prop and a personal fashion statement. His hair was bright red and always made me think of flames slipping out from beneath the hat's brim to lick and tease at the corners of his too wide grin. A set of ivory dice were his constant companions, and he'd spent so much time playing with them, rolling them, and calling the rolls, that he could run the things over the tops of his knuckles, back into his palm, and out again so fast, it was like they were alive, scuttling over his skin. Bones walked the alleys and dusty streets off park, and most folks left him alone. If you stopped to talk, You'd end up hunkered down against the wall or seated on the walk, your back against cold brick and your eyes trapped in the mesmerizing dance of the dice. You'd end up betting something or everything or talking about things you didn't mean to talk about. Bones was like that. There were mysteries under that pale skin. Roads had passed beneath his boot soles and you felt it as you tried not to stare at the lines of his face. Hard, ridged scar lines traced routes to hell and back again. Burn marks. Somewhere along the roads, bones had walked, it had gotten mighty hot, but not hot enough to melt those damn dice. All of that said, I should have known better than to call his name that dark, dank afternoon. I should have kept silent and shuffled past. My hands pressed deep in the pockets of my worn jeans, and my eyes to the ground in the safety of ant hills and sidewalk cracks. I could pave a street from coast to coast with the things I should have known better than to do. When I saw Bones that afternoon, I waved and called a greeting. Evening, Cully, he said, striding toward me quickly. It was late, but Bones wore dark glasses. Some said he wore them because of the burns, that a fire had disfigured his face, had nearly ruined his eyes, and he didn't want anyone to see. Others said there was something powerful in his stare, even from behind the glasses, and that he used the dark lenses to blunt it so he could draw you in with his voice before he released them to snare you. Still others said there were no eyes behind the glasses at all, and he was a demon who walked straight out of hell to bring those dice to our streets and our lives, take more in return than a man could ever pay out in winnings. I wasn't thinking about any of that. I was watching the dice doing their scrambling dance across his fingers, and I was thinking about cold beer and hot meat. Food was hard to come by in those days, and I'd already spent half the money I'd made that week just keeping out of the rain and weather. My stomach ached and I'd been cramping with hunger. Bones read all that in my eyes and more. He stopped a few feet away from me, cocked his head at such an angle 
that I was sure his hat would drop off the side of his head and let the curled mass of red hair fall beneath, free. The hat did not fall. He watched me that way, very quiet, and then he smiled. Bet Boyle? He asked. His voice was low, crooning and chorus at the same time. I heard him fine, but was not able to say a moment later if he'd spoken out loud or I'd read the question reflected in those flat, dark lenses. I was nodding and stepping closer before the echo of the question had faded. At a dime, bet a dollar, he commented cryptically. Step into my parlor, Collie, and I'll show you a secret. I knew the secrets he was going to show me well enough. My hand, still deep in my pocket, was wrapped tightly around a few coins I had to my name, embedding the faces of famous dead men and the inscription, In God We Trust, into the skin of my palm with the pressure. Sweat glued my shirt to my arms and pasted it to my back, but I fought to keep my step steady. I didn't speak. Not yet. My voice would have betrayed me. It was a foolish conceit. He knew all there was to know by stealing it from my eyes. And when I tried to learn something in return, all I got was my own reflection. He slipped into the alley behind Maltenary's pub and I followed, glancing to the right and left as if someone might notice, or step forward to save me from my own despair. Neither unlikely event took place and I rounded a pile of rubbish to find Bones waiting, his ankles crossed and his left boot toe down and twisting slowly back and forth. His left hand was pressed to the wall, and in the right, the dice danced. I stared at him for a moment, and then I turned, leaned against the wall and dug the coins from my pocket. He watched me carefully, and without looking, I held out my hand, palm up to show what I had. I expected the coins to disappear in a quick flourish, but they did not. He stood, watching me and rolling his dice in endless trails over the knuckles of his hands. When I glanced up at him in confusion, he spoke. You got nothing to bet, Cully? He asked softly. I gripped the coins and shook them at him. It wasn't much, but there wasn't a player on the street that would turn it down as a bet. Bones never turned down a bet. It's all I got, I said. I need to eat. I hadn't meant to say that last, and I bit down hard on my lip, pinching my eyes against a sudden flood of tears. That ain't all you got, Collie, he said. Then he laughed, and I started to get mad. It's all I got, I insisted. You don't want to bet? I'll find someone who does. Oh, I'll bet, Collie, he said, accenting the words with a deep chuckle. I'll bet, but that ain't going to do it, and you know it. You play for food. You play for a place to stay. You play every day. This time, we play for everything. That is everything, I said, turning away. What's on the chain, Collie? He whispered. I stopped. I'd lived on the street since the age of five, as near as I could place it. Couldn't have told you my mother's name or what the color of my father's eyes had been, but I had one tie to the past. On a cheap metal chain, like the kind soldiers wore their names and numbers on about their necks, I kept a watch. The watch was steel, old as the hills and broken. It hadn't kept time in all the years I'd owned it, I never ticked or talked or kept time with my heart. It was cold and lifeless, but when I was alone, too cold or too hungry, I flipped the case open and stared at my own reflection, letting my mind paint lines and creases across the face that stared back at me, trying to see my father. I can't bet that, I said. You wouldn't want it, I added. It's broken. Won't tell you the time. What does it tell you then, Cully? He asked. His voice whispered through the cracks in the bricks and echoed off the tall, close walls. Down the street, I heard voices approaching and my skin grew clammy. 
I knew one of the voices as well as I knew my own. Tiger, I said softly. The tombstones. They were trouble, named for the likely destination of those who crossed them. Tiger was pure snake evil. Bones cocked his head further to the side. Best to put your money away, Cully, he advised. Best to bet what you've got. You've got time, all cooped up and sealed away. All trapped, all snapped, tight in a metal box. Won't tell you the time, eh? Place your bet. The dice leapt from knuckle to knuckle on his long slender hand. His boot continued its side-to-side -side pendulum swivel, as though attached clockworks of its own. Boot heels crunched gravel, and I knew the tombstones were moments away. I knew them, knew Tiger, their first, and knew what to expect if he caught me alone in the alley with bones. Something to bet, something to steal. All the same to Tiger, all the same to the tombstones. They wouldn't touch bones. Tombstones like to bet. They'd take my few coins and bet. And Bones would take that bet, but he wouldn't take mine. Sounds like time is about up. I growled, clutching the watch chain tightly. They'll pass, he said matter-of-factly. They won't see what can't be. And we can't be betting unless you pull that fine watch out and place it on the ground, boy, oh. Hot words flowed to my lips, but I bit them back. I heard Tiger's grating, gravelly voice, heard harsh laughter in return, and the crunching staccato of their boots keeping time, making time, fading away. They passed the end of the alley and I never glanced inside. I stood, struck dumb by the sheer luck of it. There had been twelve tombstones in that group, if there had been one. Not a man or boy among them glanced my way. I wasn't that far into the alley, not well concealed. Bones leaned casually on the wall, as if nothing at all had just taken place. But as I turned back to him, he grinned so wide that he thought his face would split. I'm so wasting, Tully, he whispered. Place your bet. I pulled the watch from my pocket and held it in the palm of my hand was smooth and cool, and already I was forgetting what it had felt like when it was mine. What's the bet? I asked. And possibly his smile widened. I watched his hands as the dice began to roll. Word on the street had always been that bones rolled clean, but it was hard to believe when you saw him in action. He could make those tiny bits of ivory dance across his knuckles, up and back, under and across the palm, stop and reverse. How could you not believe that he knew the numbers before they fell? How could you feel the game wasn't stacked against you when your eyes were drawn up to those symbols running up the sides of his hat or the dark glasses? How could you believe he was telling you the truth when you never saw his eyes? I hunkered down, laid the watch on the ground near the wall, and looked up. As I did so, I thought it was the same way you could believe a beat-up broken watch you'd owned for so long, you had no idea where it came from, could show you the face of your father. What's the bet? I repeated, my hand still palm down over the watch. Bones leaned down then. He didn't seem to move quickly. His pale, angular face was inches from my own before I could repeat my question or even draw the breath to speak. His teeth were yellow and uneven, with sharp canines like a cur dog. The smile that had dazzled me a moment before sickened me, and his eyes were crisscrossed with red veins. I'd seen eyes like those before. They were old eyes. They were pap cement's eyes down on 4th and Broadway. So dim you had to be inches away from them, or speak, for him to know who was there. I think you know, he said softly. If you don't, let me surprise you. You need to eat. 
you need a place to sleep that those coins can't buy you. Time is money. Money is time. Bones hesitated then, as if he was afraid I'd either take the watch, curse him, and run away, or maybe he was afraid I wouldn't. I barely heard him. As he'd leaned close, my gaze had slid to the bag around his throat. The top of that bag hung open, and I caught a gleam of bright white over the rim. I shivered and removed my hand from the face of the watch. Bones never even looked at it. His wrist flicked once, twice, drew back, and leaned down very quickly. Call, boy what's your pleasure? Six, I whispered. I don't know why I spoke so softly. I wasn't even sure he'd heard me until he flicked that wrist a third time, and the tiny white cubes floated through the air toward the wall. I saw flashes of black and white. The whirling dots left odd black trails behind as they spun, giving the impression that they were drawing symbols in the air. I stared at those symbols and then realized they weren't there. They were only lines in the air, but they had distracted me, and by the time I looked down, the dice had hit the wall, bounced, and fallen. My eyes filled with tears and my stomach clenched. Two single spots returned my stare. Snake eyes. The hunger returned so suddenly that it overwhelmed me. For a few moments, I'd been intent on the dice and on the roll, too wrapped up in whether the tombstones would step in off the street to kick in my head to think about food. Now, watching Bone's long, slender fingers reaching out and grasping the dice, pain stabbed through me like a blunt knife. Wait! I croaked, trying to slide my palm back over the face of the old watch. I was too slow. There were already fingers there, and mine slid over those instead, grasped, missed, and came up empty. Bones already stood over me, staring at the watch. He flipped the case open with a casual flick of his thumb, and I saw him staring at himself reflected where I had seen my own face too often. His eyes narrowed, then he turned back to grin at me. Something was gone from that grin, something integral to the energy and the mystery, something that filled in the gaps of his broken-toothed smile and molded the leather hat closer around the red, red curls of his hairs. No time, boy he whispered. Never enough time. Then he was gone. I lowered my face into the palms of my hands and wept. I still had the small pile of change in my pocket, and I knew eventually that I'd have to do something with it or starve. But at that moment it didn't matter. Nothing mattered. As the afternoon shadows grew longer and longer, until they stretched out and wrapped themselves around me, blending me to the wall of the alley, I dozed my breath keeping time with the dull, throbbing pain of the hunger. I woke to the toe of a boot connecting with my foot. Not too hard, not painful, but insistent. My mind had fogged with sleep, and it was several moments before I realized someone was speaking to me. Wake up! The voice was deep, gravelly, and wholly unfamiliar. I opened my eyes. I expected the first sensation to be hunger. My back ached, cold from the brick of the wall, and yet something more. My muscles had grown stiff and I had to balance myself with one hand on the ground as I glanced up. The man standing over me was dressed in blue and gold, black leather and bright buttons. His eyes were filled with contempt, and he held a long, smooth black stick in his hand. I thought, police, and then thought again. Never seen anything like this in uniform. I'd never seen anything like that stick, and the sight of it kept me mesmerized. The man flipped the stick casually, but with a jumpy, nervous energy beneath taut skin. He whirled it over his fingers and back into his palm. I thought about bones and the dice. 
You need to move along, he said. I watched the stick dance for a moment longer, then nodded resignedly. I was happy that the hunger hadn't hit me too hard and left me weak. I rose shakily, brushed the dust from the seat and legs of my pants, and stared at him. Definitely place, I thought. I didn't know when they'd changed uniforms or who this man was, but I knew better than to cause problems, particularly since he had that stick, particularly with the twitching dance of muscle beneath the man's skin as he itched to apply that ebony club to my body. I was so stiff I couldn't quite stand up straight, but I managed to catch myself in the wall, and in a moment the pain eased. I turned toward the mouth of the alley, but before I could take a step, he laid a hand on my shoulder. I flinched. Easy, he said. You're forgetting something. I turned back and saw that he'd pointed to the dirt at my feet with the tip of that smooth black stick. I followed the line extending from the tip and stopped dead in my tracks. Face up, the case opened so that the dial was fully visible, sat the watch. It was just as it had been when I had last seen Bones holding it, though it seemed battered, aged somehow from what it had been. I glanced up and down the alley, but there was no one in sight but the oddly dressed policeman. I leaned down, grabbed the watch, flipped it closed, and slipped it into my pocket. Thank you, I said. You should take better care of your things, he answered. I didn't look at his face, but I heard the frown in his voice. You should take better care of yourself. All the time in the world won't help if you let yourself go. I nodded and turned toward the mouth of the alley once again. As I did so, he sighed, and I heard his footsteps receding as he turned in the opposite direction and strode off down the alley. I staggered into the street. I knew I'd been asleep too long in a sitting position, cramped against the chilly brick wall, but it just didn't explain the lethargy that gripped me. My joints screamed, and I couldn't seem to clear the fog completely from my sight, no matter how many times I shook my head. I rubbed my knuckles over my closed eyes, and at that touch, I grew very still. You know the feel of certain things, the way you know the sun will come up, and that cold water sliding down your throat on a hot day will feel like heaven. You know the touch of your own fingers, the brush of skin over skin, you've felt a thousand times. And I did not know this one. I did not know the fingers that rubbed my swollen eyes. I drew my hand away and held it out, squinting through the hazy fog that clouded my vision. The hand was thin, bony and wrinkled. Hairs sprouted from the knuckle, and thin blue veins crisscrossed beneath the surface of the skin. I slid that hand into my pocket and fished out the watch. I don't know what compelled me to flip it open as I stepped into the dying afternoon light along Park, but I did. I stared into the tarnished, rusted surface of the case. A stranger stared back at me. He had my eyes, but they were yellowed and dimmed, surrounded by creases and wrinkles that shot out from the corners and slid beneath the deep, furrowed patches of shadow. The stranger had a mustache, its hairs uneven and gray, sticking out at odd angles where food and drink had plastered themselves to it and stuck. My hand shook, and seconds later the watch fell from my grip. I glanced down and watched it flipping through the air, catching the dying sunlight, and flipping it this way and that, drawing glowing letters and numbers in the air drawing hours and days, and erasing them so swiftly, they left no image burned in the pages of my memory. The watch struck the pavement and shattered, sending shards of glass and tiny springs bouncing in all directions. On the street, I saw a passing car through a sudden blur of tears. It was black, polished to a mirror finish and sleek. I had never seen its like. Windows were tinted, so I couldn't see through, but still, I caught a flash of white, bone white, 
After the car passed, I saw two black dots strobed in the air where I'd seen the white flashes in the window. Snake eyes rolling in the breeze. I heard footsteps behind me, but I didn't turn. That old watch won't tell you the time, Boyle. Bones said softly, but time will tell you to watch, and then it slips away. One moment cooped up, snapped tight in a bright shiny case, and the next it's gone. I turned slowly. He stood, leaning against the brick wall that was like no wall I'd ever seen. Nothing about him had changed. His eyes were bright, the red hair curled out from under that old leather top hat and the dice danced across the knuckle of one hand. He leaned and picked up the chain that had been attached to my watch. He slipped it into the bag around his neck and grabbed the faceplate of the watch case from where it had broken free and spun off against the wall. Bones glanced into it, smiled, and I saw that the bits and pieces of that smile had returned. Like he'd been attached loosely with strings and someone had yanked him back tight in the center. He turned his gaze back to me and flipped a watch case to me like a coin, spinning lazily over and over as it came. I raised my hand instinctively and caught it. Bones winked at me then, and I shivered, finding that the sensation was different through old bones and old nerves, and that it ended in a quiet shaking that didn't really subside. You lost the bet, Boyle, Bones said, turning away and stepping back into the alley. But you finally found what you were looking for in the watch. I turned the bright metal disc over in my hand and stared at it once again. My father's face stared back, and he started to cry. I hope you enjoyed Nothing But Time by David Niall Wilson, as performed by yours truly. This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by our sponsor, Apartments.com. Life can be full of unexpected events, and unfortunately for us, not all of them are good. Police deadlines creep up on you faster than a cheetah with its ass on fire. And that's not to mention all the other things that can cause residential displacement. Or perhaps it's the opposite. Have you ever had one of those moments where you realize it's time to find a new place? They call it an out-of-apartment experience. It could be life-altering, like finding out your little family's growing or something more life-annoying, like dealing with a broken change machine at the laundromat. If you find yourself in an out-of-apartment experience, start your search for a new place on Apartments.com. Apartments.com has helped millions of renters and could help you find your perfect place. And yep, I know perfect is a tall order, even in the best of times. But my favorite part about Apartments.com is that they have all the right tools to help you find the right fit, whether you're looking for an apartment or a condo, a town home or a house. And their powerful search tools help you find a listing that checks all your boxes. So take a moment and check out apartments.com, the place to find a place. Apartments.com has helped millions of renters and could help you find your perfect place. And yep, I know Perfect is a tall order, even in the best of times. But whether you're looking for an apartment or a condo, townhome or a house even, Apartments.com has all the right tools to help you find it. Their site allows you to use filters and saved searches to narrow down rental listings and find exactly the place for you. You can even set up alerts to get notified as places become available. So, fashionistas, get a place with that ridiculously large closet you've been eyeing, or even get a place with a special hallway for an in-unit washer-dryer. And on the other hand, if you're a sun lover, you'll be able to find as much natural light as you can handle. 
If you're working from home, you can have an area for your home office, an extra bathroom, a balcony, central heating or air, or dishwasher in the kitchen. Whatever happens to be right for you, this is the place to find it. Apartments.com, the place to find a place. Thank you for listening and for supporting the sponsors that make this show possible. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash david dash wilson that's simply scary podcast.com slash d-a-v-i-d dash w-i-l-s-o-n winner of the bram stoker award on numerous occasions he's the author of the grail's covenant trilogy and the the chance chronicles and founded and is current ceo of crossroads press Dave and I go way back, 2012, where I performed my very first audiobook for him, Prairie Chicken Kill by Bill Critter. If you do decide to stop by his profile, please leave David a kind word and let him know you heard about him here on this show and that me, Otis Jiry, sent you. It really would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author time travel, insanity, simple magic. In any case, Bone seemed like the kind of person who you just don't bet against in any circumstances. Well, maybe if it's magic you're seeking, you might have a little more luck with the next story from David Nell. If you start gambling, things have a chance to go against you. But sometimes it's not luck. It's precision. You may need to get things just right or else. And that's exactly what one soul needs to do. Because if he doesn't, then worse things could happen. Without further ado, I present to you The Level of the Flame. The border's only 10 miles away. Telephone poles blur together with green mile markers and flashing billboards. The dashboard illuminates the tiny world within an old Buick, giving it the appearance of a spaceship control console from some B-grade sci-fi flick. Jose fancies that he can see the bones of his fingers silhouetted within the glowing skin of his hands. Five miles. Fertile countryside fades mile by mile to dust. Buildings grow scarce. Only the wind disturbs the open desert beyond the road, the wind and the night spirits. Jose shivers, passing the thought from his mind. This is no night for games in the head. He'll need it to be clear. If all goes as planned, he may need it to survive. Two miles. Eduardo lies twenty miles in the past. Seems like years of time and space separate them. That's fine. There's much to do, much to learn, before those miles can pass beneath him again, before he can return. If he's to teach Eduardo the lessons he has planned, he must first become the student. The moonlit landscape radiates solitude, closing him in with the weight of limitless space. One mile. Ahead, the lights of the crossing glimmer faintly. The warning beacons atop the bridge beckon like stationary fireflies. They seem to float in the air, suspended in the depths of a pool of darkness, illusion, road hypnosis. As the distance closes, the illusion fades. The bridge melts from the mist that rise from the river. An old man steps uncertainly from the shack beside the bridge. He wears a gun, but there is no courage in his step. He might as well be naked. Pulling to a stop, Jose smiles, flashing his driver's license. The flashlight beam dances over the card, his face, and the seat. 
where it passes, echoed flash patterns steal Jose's sight for a moment. It reminds him of a kaleidoscope he'd once owned. The patterns fade to a weathered face, framed in bristling gray whiskers and topped by a gray cowboy hat. Kind of late crossing, ain't you? A voice rasps. It's a voice beset by time and cheap whiskey. A common voice. Don't get much traffic this time of night. Jose smiles again. I, I have someone to see, he explains. She gives very odd hours, and it's a long drive. I see, the old one says, not seeing it all. Well, go ahead, then. The border passes beneath him, leaving no sign that it was there. Silence unfolds itself once more from the land about him, embracing the old car and emphasizing the steady roar of its engine. It sounds as loud as a jetliner in the void. Funny, Jose thinks. I never noticed the sound in the city. In a herd of its kind, the Buick runs silent. Like still visions passing through a slide projector, manual's instructions click through Jose's mind. Speak only when asked. Never meet her eyes. Do not laugh. Forget nothing. One lost word could cost you more than you're willing to pay. Very strange words spoken seriously. Jose had committed them to memory. Manuel was old. Manuel was maybe a little strange, perhaps even crazy. But he knew the power. The old power. Not that of neon electronics or chemical chains that bound one's mind. Power of the soul. Power of the land. Eduardo did not know Jose had come here. Had he known, he would have laughed. Eduardo believed in private trinity, the green of his cash, the burn of his white powder personality, always flowing through his veins, and the shining chrome of his gun. Eduardo was a fool. Jose had not seen Carla in three days. His little sister had gone to Eduardo, gone for good. Carla's only sixteen, and without their father and their mother, there's only Jose. First, it was Eduardo's flashy smile. Next came flashy clothes. Then the cocaine. Jose had warned her, screamed at her, but the drugs had dulled her wits. The shine had faded from her eyes. They're like mirrors in which his reflection wavers, and he must clear them before they're blank forever. Shakes loose those nagging worries, concentrating again on the road before him. The darkness holds him possessively. Only the twin-eyed glare of the Buick's headlights mark the way. The moon is hidden behind a screen of low-hanging clouds. Is it frightened, he wonders. He is. Perhaps he's a fool, too, driving alone in an empty desert. Alone, that is, except for the night spirits and for Juana. His earlier shiver returns, and it'll not be brushed aside. The miles, so recently endless, grow rapidly too short. What if she's not there? What if she chooses not to speak? What if, God forbid, he angers her? Too many questions, no answers. There's only the chill in his blood and the desert road. His father told him tales. His grandmother had told him others. Jose had feared to ask them of their grandfathers and had feared their answers. It had been said by some that the name Juana had been passed down that many had borne it. It was said by others that some were fools, and that Juana simply remained. Jose believed there were questions that led to madness. He didn't ask them. The mountain looms ahead, lending an even darker shade to a land already deep in shadow. There were no lights. Where is she? The deepest shadows seemed to beckon, his eyes widen with fear, and his heart keeps time with the Buick's wheels, which play an intricate rhythm on the crumbling, uneven pavement. 
slows the car and stops. Dark shapes coalesce as his eyes adjust. The removal of the invading headlights has softened the darkness, freeing his vision. The moon's glow steadies his courage, in contrast to the suddenly claustrophobic interior of the Buick. Leaving it behind, he moves toward the mountain. He sees nothing, but knows there's something here to see. Flicker of orange light draws his attention to a rocky outcropping. Tongues of flame speak fire words to his eyes. He's certain there had not been such a light there when he stopped. Grasping at the fraying strands of his courage, he moves toward the light, a glowing halo around a large stone. He can't see the fire clearly, only the talons of light and shadow formed from dancing winds among eclipsed embers. Is it really there? Sparks leap to challenge the stars as he rounds the stone. A stick is poking the glowing coals. A huddled figure is seated directly across the fire from him. For a moment, indecision rules. Then, seeing no acknowledgement of his presence in the other's posture, receiving no nod or glance, he seats himself cross-legged on the ground to wait. Speak only when asked. The silence is waited by anticipation. Jose controls a strong urge to clear his throat. Crickets chirp with unnerving volume. An owl hoots, long and mournful. The stick pokes once more into the fire's embers, and the sparks dance. Figure's head rises slowly, shifting like the sands. The head drops back, drifting over bony shoulders now visible in the flickering light. Seamed skin wrinkles further with the mouth's opening. The eyes do not smile. He wonders briefly what color they are beyond the firelight. Tonight, they glow red. Why have you come? Granted to speak, Jose is silent. How to word it? I seek justice, he says finally. You seek revenge. The voice corrects almost patronizingly. Jose almost retorts, catches his silence, and clenches it between gnashing teeth. The eyes alone live in a wrinkled ocean of age. Jose shifts his own gaze about nervously. Never meet her eyes. Seeing is difficult through unfocused eyes. It's a statement. Jose does not answer. Neither does he meet her gaze. The silence returns, but it's no longer a wait. It's supplanted by a scrutiny of deepest insight. Jose's fears flutter behind the tingling of her probe, ready to blossom to panic if she provokes it. A sense of nakedness washes through him, a violation, wondering what might happen if he slips and catches her gaze full on. He shudders. This Eduardo is a strong man. This comment brings derision to Jose's eyes. His lips quiver on the verge of a sneer. He does not laugh. Do not laugh. Are you stronger then? She asks. She knows the answer, but Jose speaks it. No, Meister, but you are. That is why I'm here. Silence again. Even the crickets do not speak. The owl has forgotten to voice its sorrow. Jose prepares to remember whatever she tells him. One lost word could cost you more than you're willing to pay. Hunger ebbs from the shadows. The fire seems to flare and close in. Her gaze bores through his forehead but he still does not meet it. He feels forces undulating about his body, turning among the strands of his hair, fondling the extremities of his limbs, testing. The meaning of Manuel's final instruction rises to the surface of his understanding. He feels ghost touches on the fringes of that which is more than he's willing to pay. This shudder is violent. Sweat coats his skin instantly, cold sweat, 
dampening his shirt, matting his hair. The power you seek surrounds you. She mutters, and he sees her gnomish form begin to sway with the flickering motion of the flames. It is in and of you, she continues. Concentrates, memorizing, not yet looking for understanding, only for precision. Your enemy has power, but of another level, a lower level, the level of man. You seek the level of flame. You seek the fire, the burning, the cleansing. It must come from you as well. Rushing wings sound in the air above. The fire crackles. The crickets begin anew, louder and more discordant. Nature blocks his understanding. He fights, catching the final words in a strange, detached mental grope. He must burn you melt you to nothing. Then will his soul be yours. Then shall he grow cold. A fold opens in her tattered cloak. A withered hand, twin of that which still pokes the fire, snakes free. It holds a small wooden bowl. The hand moves the bowl toward his eyes, bringing its contents into focus. Dark green like forest pine, but opaque. Now he knows the color of her eyes. Don't stare, he tells himself. Don't meet her eyes. The bowl is like a third eye. Jose shifts his gauge, and she speaks a final word, a single command. Drink. Domino revelations fall one upon another in slow motion. He feels himself rising, floating, feels miles run like water beneath him. The glow is that of the dashboard. He knows this, but the knowledge is separate from the sensation. The bridge approaches. He stops. The old man, face melting wrinkles to jaw, dripping suspicion, grows to giant size in his vision. He screams meaningless sounds at incredible pounding volume. Jose mashes the pedal and flies, spinning the decaying age-ridden apparition away, launching forward to embrace the solitude of the road. Multicolored light washes across the skyline as dawn drifts to day. He remembers to look at the road, make the curve, barely. Numbness creeps out to greet his nerves. Twenty miles end in bleak betrayal as his weak-willed mind collapses to black. The Buick rests silently. Jose feels the part skin of his lips burning as he forces them apart. His throat is so thick with bile and dried mucus that he can barely breathe. Sounds bombard him from all sides. Day sounds. City sounds. He groped for purchase on the dash, the steering wheel pulling himself upright as sparks of pain stab into his brain. Walls surround him brick and stone, crumbling, covered with painted names and curses from a thousand young souls. Remnants. Nobody's near. The walls form an alley. More fog slips from his mind. He knows this alley. He's close to home, and that's where he must go, quickly. He leaves the Buick in the alley. It's daylight and he's alone. Did anyone see him come in? Not likely. He's alive, whole, and alone. His head aches with a constant pressure. He wants to explode. Prevented by stubborn bone and skin, it complains. He slips through the shadows and enters an adjoining street. His movements are furtive, though the street is attached to his home. It's not part of it. The street is Eduardo's. Eduardo is the street. The street's filthy and he does not like the feel of it beneath his feet. He fears its touch, as though some malign sentient might allow it to announce his trespassing to Eduardo, or to the man's friends. Eduardo calls many friends. Jose is not among them. Though he's never dared to speak out, he has watched Eduardo's eyes 
as the man's filthy hands explored Carla, watched for the final reason and the proper moment to kill. Somehow the key is in the lock and nobody's seen him. Sweat trickles and swirls down the back of his collar, carving valleys in the dust of the desert, which still covers him. Sweat feels like molten ice. The door swings inward, then shuts behind him. It is dark, but little cooler inside than on the street. Jose flips on a light and goes to the bathroom. He sticks his head under the shower and turns on the cold water. He must awaken fully. He must remember. One lost word could cost you more than you're willing to pay. Memory is elusive. What is real? He can't say, only what he feels. Ancient eyes blend with strange words and with flames. He cannot focus the memory enough to see her face. He cannot recall the timbre of her voice. He recalls only her words. How can they serve him? You seek the level of the flame. It must be of you as well. He must melt you to nothing. Then shall his soul be yours. Then shall he grow cold. The words will not mesh. They're meaningless. He needs to talk with Manuel to think. He knows he must not sleep until the instructions are carried out, but his body sags already with the effort to remain alert. Carla depends on him. Her life depends on this night. Little Carla, sister and friend, helplessly ensnared in Eduardo's network of drugs and sex, so far gone, she believes she wants to be there, though no spark lights her eyes, no spring encourages her steps. She is as one dead, another death on Eduardo's shoulders, another debt to be paid. Memory swings further back, an uncontrolled pendulum. His mother had also had tales of Juana. Though she had crossed herself thrice each time, the name was mentioned, shuddering. There were tales of women's days, of candles and chants, of weaving and cooking, brewing and singing. Power, the power of the flame, the power of Juana, candles. His heart speeds, his mind knows the solution, as though it had been obvious all along. He moves in a daze to the kitchen, eyes vacant, as his mind travels other trails. Wax, wooden bowl, metal pot, scissors, a sharp knife, sharp like a razor, tools. This night, he will burn. Eduardo will burn him. He will melt to nothing, melt in the power of the flame. Jose staggers from the altar, no strength in his limbs. Behind him, the flames rise, steady and hot. The domed ceiling of the old church bounces shadows about its surface at the candle's bidding. There are many candles on the altar. There are white candles burning to praise. There are red candles burning to save. There are blue candles burning to heal. There's another candle. This candle burns to cleanse. Dark, green like the ocean's depths, straight with the brown of Jose's dried and caked blood, pitted with the clippings of foot and hand, entwined with the strands of his hair. Its smoke is less pure. Its odor is dark, maleficent. It's sculpted with the twin images of Jose and Eduardo, one per side, molded crudely, but carefully with shaking hands. It is burning fast. Tottering down darkening streets, Jose moves like a zombie, searching for the alley leading to Manuel. He must stay awake. He must remain aware. The flame is of him, in him, and it seeks him as well. It hungers. It does not care upon whom it feasts. Only Jose can direct it away. He's nearly beyond thought as he staggers to the doorway, nearly collapsing at Manuel's feet. Jose watches feverishly as the older man reads the lines of his face, brushing a light hand over his brow 
and testing the currents of the air. He sees Manuel shudder. He helps Jose to shake his feet, leading him inside. In the center of the room, there is a fire, where Jose wonders for the hundredth time, does the smoke go? It's not important. He is falling asleep, failing. He, Manuel, acts quickly. He pulls an old thin dagger from the folds of his coat. Reaching out, he plunges it into Jose's arm, twisting it violently. Jose screams, backing away. Searing pain tears at his mind, pulls him from the abyss of darkness, opening to swallow his existence into meaninglessness. There is sorrow in Manuel's eyes, but no apology. The knife rises again and plunges, finding the flesh of Jose's thigh. He does not sleep. He must not sleep. He must burn you to nothing. It must come from you. Eduardo puts a firm hand around Carla's shoulder, running smooth, ringed fingers over the curve of her young breasts. His nose is buried in her hair, and he mumbles to her words she can barely understand through the narcotic haze of her thoughts. She feels him. She feels the drug. It is a wonderful sensation. And she leans against him, eyes blank. Then she screams. He yanks back his head, pulls free his arms, and screams. His hands become claws, ripping at his arms. His eyes become burning flames, glowing and sparking with each new convulsion. Carla's confused, but she watches with hazy interest as he scuttles away from her on the couch, tumbling to the floor and writhing in obvious agony. He is screaming of burning. He is screaming of fire. There is no fire, but he's ripping the skin from his own body, splattering blood on the white of Carla's blouse. Reaching down absently, she takes a drop on her finger, bringing it to her lips and smiling. Jose is flying, lost in pain, lost in a vision, lost in flame. He sees Eduardo's face, hovering nearby, screaming. He feels the heat of Eduardo's breath, scalding him, cursing him, dying. He feels the flames surround him, carrying him toward a sky of crimson and orange. He feels the dagger plunge yet again, finding his other arm, tearing his flesh. He revels in the pain, drawing it about him, wearing it as a shield. He feels his blood pouring down his flesh, puddling on the floor, he does not relinquish his control. Eternities pass. He feels the snuff of candle flame. The final drop of wax to altar, dripping like new-drawn blood. He sees the puff of smoke rise, wearing Eduardo's eyes. He sees it swirl, twisting downward, sifting through the sands of a desert. He sees it drown in a bowl of deepest green. He looks into the world behind that green and finds Manuel's eyes. Jose smiles. Sleep is a deep lake. He plunges in. Manuel, seeing that it has ended, stays his knife. Jose awakens. Manuel does not meet his eyes. Manuel drops his knife and slowly begins to bind the wounds on Jose's arms does not meet the boy's eyes. He never will. I hope you enjoyed The Level of the Flame by David Niall Wilson, as performed by yours truly. If you've enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you just one last time that tonight's featured author can be found by visiting our website, just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash David dash Wilson. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash D-A-V-I-D dash W-I-L-S-O-N. David is a very accomplished, award-winning author, and beyond his many published works, you'll be able to find more about him at his website, davidnowwilson.com two L's in Nile. As a reminder, if you decide to give tonight's talented author's stories a read, 
Please consider leaving him a quality review and a kind word or a thoughtful public comment and an upvote. And be sure to let him know you heard about him here on this program and that Otis Jiry sent you. It means a lot more to me than you can imagine, and I'm pretty sure David would very much appreciate it as well. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have presented 10 seasons of this show for your oral enjoyment. And can't wait for what's to come in seasons 11 and beyond. If you've enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well, at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, and our new season, stay spooky, and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. 
In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>